Acts, and I'm going to chapter 26, and we're going to be reading about where the Apostle Paul is giving his testimony here before King Agrippa, and we know that at the end Paul had to go to Rome, and, and there were a lot of trials leading up to that, and so anyway, everywhere when he gave his testimony, and here he is presently giving to the king, and I want you to notice how no matter where he went, no matter who his audience was, it could have been the lowest of the lowest, he still preached the same message, or it could have been the highest of the king of the individual that held literally Paul's life in his hands. Paul still preached unto them as well, uh, giving us uh, certainly a great, a great illustration and example of how that we need to be telling everybody that we can about the Lord. But Acts chapter 26, Stan, if you would, we're going to begin our reading at verse 15, and we're going to read down to and through verse 18. I'd initially said to uh, to uh, Ken, the 20, but if he pulls that up there, you'll just see where Paul was just saying, I'm not a disobedient to the heavenly vision and what the Lord has called me to do. But let's begin there at verse 18. 15 is where I want to begin. You, you could begin even back in verse 12, but for the sake of what I want to, verse 15. And he said, Who are you, Lord? This is where the Lord's speaking to Paul on uh, his road to Damascus. And he said, I am Jesus whom you persecute. But rise and stand up to your feet. And I have appeared unto you for this purpose, to make you a minister and a witness both of these things which you have seen and those things in which I will appear unto you or I will show you and you will experience later on in your life. Uh, delivering you from the people and from the Gentiles unto whom now I send you. Now here's, here's the key verse, so I want you to focus in on it. Uh, here's what I want you to do, Paul, the Lord says, to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to to light and from the power of Satan unto really the power of God and that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. And everybody said, Amen. 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 You may be seated. Now, once again, there's so much here. But I want to focus in on one little word. And that's what I want to talk about today. I simply call it turn. Did you see it in the scripture? I've called you to turn them from something to something else. We're going to be talking about really one of the most important aspects of our salvation initially, how we get saved, and then a very important aspect of our relationship with Jesus Christ after we are saved, as we grow in grace, as we progressively become stronger and better and more faithful unto the Lord. Turn. Turn. I believe with all of my heart of what is being described here that the work of the cross of Jesus Christ is the single most important and endeavor of mankind. And what I mean by that is that when you and I experience salvation, a personal relationship with Jesus Christ on a personal basis, and, 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 and we know the joy of this forgiveness of sin, and we know the joy of not having this condemnation hanging over our head or this shame uh, in our lives. But we know 
oh, just this joy unspeakable and full of glory of what it is to be a child of God, then what do we want to do? Yeah, we want to continue on with the Lord, but we want to tell everybody everywhere we go and we want them to experience the same thing that you and I have experienced. So this very important endeavor. But there's one thing that is crystal clear. It wasn't to all of us all the time, but it is now. And that is, is that this great salvation is offered to us as a free gift from God. There is absolutely nothing, zilch, zero, nada, that you or I can ever do to achieve it, to accomplish it, to earn it, to deserve it, whether it be by our own efforts or by our own merits. It doesn't matter how uh, good you try to become on your own. Uh, we cannot earn it. It is a free gift of God. And we know that it is based upon the substitutionary work of Jesus Christ. It's because the Lord was willing to do what he did and come Emmanuel as we just celebrated uh, the birth of Christ, God in the flesh, and he came and he lived and he died and he rose again. And why did he do all that? It's because he was becoming the substitute for you and me. God didn't just say, you know what, if you want to be forgiven, I'm going to forgive you just arbitrarily. I'm going to do away with all of the laws that I've given. We're just going to do away with them and I'm going to forgive you. No. Uh, he left the law intact and therefore somebody had to die because that's the the uh, you know what we get because of uh, what we see because of our sin and so Jesus died he became our substitute and now that the price has been paid the Lord is able to offer this wonderful free gift Hallelujah. of salvation and eternal life for you and for me. The thing that I want us to realize is this, though. Is even though I've described all of that, I don't want us to think that we have nothing to do with our salvation. You see, when it comes to the accomplishing of our salvation. We have nothing to do with it. God has done everything and gives it to us as a free gift. So the accomplishing, we have nothing, no say in it. But when it comes to the accepting of our salvation, we have everything to do with it. Because when God presents that free gift to us, we don't have to take it. We can reject it. And that's us. And really, <clears throat> your and my responsibility in our relationship with Jesus Christ, it can really be surmised in this one word that we've accentuated in our text here, which is turn. Turn. We know what turn means. It means to alter one's course. It means to change the direction in which you are going or which you are headed. In the biblical sense, it literally means to make a complete 180. You're headed in one direction. We see that God in the world, God in sin are completely diametrically opposed on opposite ends of each other. So when you are walking towards the world and sin and Satan and living in sin and you become a child of God, what happens? You literally do a 180 and you start walking in the direction of God, his word, his will and his way. And you see, the, the, it, it's very simple. 
the more that you walk towards sin, the closer you get to it and the farther you get from God. But when you turn around and you start this direction, obviously you get closer to God and farther from the world. So that's what, he, that's what he's telling us. That's what, he, that's what he's saying. When we become a child of God, turn! Yes, praise God. Yes. Amen. Have you made that turn? Have I made that turn? And that's what we want to discuss here. And the great thing about it is, is that this turn in our lives, you can only make it for yourself. I can only make that decision to turn for myself. I can't make it for you. You can't make it for me. I can preach till I'm blue in the face. I can sit out in council and tell you everything that I know in the Word of God, but I cannot make you accept it. You are the only one that can. I can't make it for you. You can't make it for me. We can't make it even for our children. They have to make it for themselves. God can't even make it for us. He, in his creation of man, he didn't want just a bunch of robots programmed to do something without a choice or mind. But no, he made us with this mechanism of volition or choice. We can choose to either go to heaven or go to hell. We can choose to go toward God or go toward Satan. We can choose to live in the light or to live in the darkness. And did you see here that, that in this description of what the Lord, when he says turn, you turn from the darkness and you turn to something else, which is, is the light. You turn from the power of Satan and you turn to the power of God. Turn. Simple, isn't it? We, we see it, if you go to work, no matter whether you walk or you drive or however you get there, we know that there's many turns in life that has to be made. If you're going to get to your destination, you've got to turn. But why is it so hard for us in the spiritual aspect to get a grip on that? Turn! I want to look at some of the aspects of what it means to turn. Uh, some of them are found here in our text. Others not necessarily in the text, but they are certainly scattered and found a multitude of times in the Word of God. And I, I want to do it in sequence so that it will maybe make it a little easier for us to get a grip on of, uh, of salvation. We know that it, it just happens in a moment's time, but we're talking about your and my response. Responsibility. What do we have to do before the Lord can save us? We have to turn. Amen. Let's talk about the first thing that I want to draw to your attention here, and I call it this, is the very first thing that has to happen is the convincing, or as King James puts it, the uh, conviction of the Spirit, of the Holy Spirit. There's got to be that convincing. There's got to be that convincing in one's heart that an individual needs to turn. You know, somebody said to ask, and I think I mentioned before, you know, one of the great deep theological questions of why do people not get saved? And, you know, we young theologians were waxing eloquent in this long answer we were giving. And the answer is simply because they won't. Because they choose not to. That's why. They choose not to. And the thing of it is, before that, that we can make a turn, we've got to be convinced that we need to turn. And that's where a lot of people are today. 
is they don't feel they need to turn. They don't feel they need to change their lifestyle. They don't feel they need to change anything in their life. Everybody's going to go to heaven anyway, and so it doesn't matter how you live, what you do, what you say. It doesn't matter where you hang out. It doesn't matter who you hang out at to hang out with. It doesn't matter any of that. So uh, what does it matter? I'm not going to change. I'm not going to turn. Let me backtrack here momentarily and I want you to see the work of the Holy Spirit in all of our lives, even before we become saved and after where He dwells in us, after we're saved. But, but this conviction, this convincing of the Holy Spirit. You remember on the day of Pentecost that after they had been filled, the 120, there's this huge crowd of, of uh, people that are there to celebrate the feast and, and the festivities. And uh, in the midst of that, Peter stands up and he preaches. And he's preaching Christ and he's preaching him crucified and resurrected. And then the Bible says in Acts chapter 2 and verse 37, the Bible says, and they were pricked in their heart. See it? What's that pricking mean? It just means what it says. If you take a stick pen and you prick yourself, you become aware of it. It's uncomfortable. You become uneasy about it. And if it continues, but this is not a physical pricking. This is the pricking, the convincing, the conviction of the Holy Spirit in your life that you need to turn. In fact, this pricking went on that these, th this multitude, they, 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 in the very next verse, if you were to read it, what, what, men and brethren, what, what must we do? We've got to respond. Something's got to be done like this. We, we can't continue to have this. And, and you'll notice what Peter said. Peter said, repent and be baptized. But this pricking of the Holy Spirit. And then we know that Jesus, speaking of the Spirit, when He's going to come, He said in uh, John chapter 16 and verse 8, But the Comforter, but the Holy Spirit, He's going to come, and He's going to convict or literally convince the world of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. So when you feel that uneasiness as, as an unbeliever about sin or even as a believer, sin in your life or whatever the case, you feel that uncomfortableness when, when it's talked about and when it's spoken about. What is that? That's the Holy Spirit trying to convince you you need to make a turn. Let's face it. If we don't think we need to make a turn, we're not going to make a turn. You know, you're lost. Have you ever been out there driving? You're lost somewhere. And, you're, and your wife just keeps saying, honey, we need to turn. We, we need to turn there. We, we, we need to turn. And how many wives know that if the husband isn't convinced that he needs to turn there, he ain't going to turn. Amen. <laughs> you got to be convinced you need to turn before you're going to turn. I guess an illustration would be when the rains come and floods, and we've all been in various degrees of floods, I would assume, in our lifetime. Maybe so much here if you're not close to the Mississippi or whatever, but, but in West Virginia, in the hills and the valleys, and when the snow would melt and come off of the mountaintop into those little streams, they would uh, flood and then into the rivers. And if you lived in the lowland, you knew what flooding was all about. And there's some very serious floods back where I grew up because the canyons were so steep and so narrow where the river uh, snaked their way through that they came through with such force. It's kind of like putting your finger on the end of a nozzle of a hose. When you do that, it creates more pressure. It creates a stronger. And so that's what happened. But have you ever come across 
in the midst of those times where a road has been maybe even barricaded, but let's say it's not barricaded, but it, but it has lights, it's flashing, has signs, high water across the road. I had that to happen to me when we were in southern Illinois and going to the hospital and we'd had severe flooding and almost got into the parsonage where we were. It was fortunately up, so it did not get in, but it flooded our garage. And every we had to bring in a, a, a large dump truck and just loaded it to the brink with stuff that we lost. And in the aftermath of that, I was going to the hospital, and it's about 45 minutes away. I'd gone one way, but thinking I could make better time coming back another way, I, here I came upon only three miles from home. Came upon this sign, water running across the road. You know, I want to get home, but I'm thinking, that looks, you could see the debris in it, and it was going pretty fast. It looked pretty deep. So I said, you know what? I'm going to turn around. It took me 25 miles out of the way to go around that. But I was convinced in my mind that I needed to turn. Back later, I don't know when we had all the, that, all that rain. I was at work and I was coming through Maryville and there's this big dip in the road and a lot of people had stopped and you could see the water in that dip. And I thought, I don't want to sit here. I'm going to have to turn back. And there was a guy with a big old uh, pickup truck, but he had it jacked up and big tires on it. He was right in front of me. I'm in my little white car. He pulls out in front of me and he's going to make a run for it. I thought, you know what? If he can make it through, I'm going to tail him all the way. And when he parts the Red Sea, I'm going to go through on dry ground. <laughs> and he took off and water was it just spraying. And I thought, guy, forgive me for tailgating you, but I hung right on his bumper. And we made it through. But you see, if you're not convinced... You're not going to turn. How many people, though, have we read about where they not convinced they can turn and they go forward and they're swept away? And then when it's too late, you know, talking back in our area, there was a guy crossing a little bridge and the water was up and it was cr over the bridge, but he was on a tractor thinking that he could make it. Well, sad to say he did not make it. So how many individuals will not turn even though the signs, the convincing, the conviction of the Holy Spirit is there? They will not turn, but one of these days they're going to wake up and it's going to be too late. No more chance to turn. You've been swept away into hell and now there's no more choice and no more chance to be able to turn. You see, we, uh, we as individuals, we never come to the Lord on our own. But we got to be drawn by the Holy Spirit. He, he, there's got to be that convincing working of the Holy Spirit that's going to bring us to Christ. And so the first, first thing, obviously, here is that, you know, we've, there's got to be the convincing of the Spirit that we will turn. But the second thing I want us to notice is there's got to be a changing of our senses. And when I say senses, I'm not using it in the sense of our five physical senses, sight, smell, taste, etc. But I'm talking about the way we use it. Will you come to your senses? Will, 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 will you come and make a, a right choice? Will, will, will you come to right thinking and rationalization? Will you come to your senses? There's there's this changing of senses. You say, Pastor, what in the world are you talking about? There's a word that is used in our conversion initially when we come to Christ. 
It is the message that John the Baptist preached, the forerunner of Christ. And it tells us in Matthew chapter 3 and verse 2, I didn't give it to Ken, but you can look it up. It says that when John came on the scene uh, he, and he began preaching, the very first word that it says, Repent! Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And then later on in chapter 3, it speaks about when Jesus enters into his own ministry. He said the same thing, and he began to preach. What was it? Repent! And then we've already seen that here, that when the Spirit of God had fallen, and the beginning of this dispensation of grace, that when Peter preached that first message, and they said, what must we do? What was his response? Repent! Yes. What does repent mean? When you chisel everything away from it and get down to just the very basic, core, simple meaning, it means the changing of one's mind. The Holy Spirit is telling me, hey bud, you're on the wrong track. You're headed in the wrong direction. You need to turn. I can be convinced in my mind that I need to turn, but there's going to have to be a changing of mind about some things. Even before, and that's what repent is speaking of. Repent, a change of mind. Let me give you an illustration of that, okay? Uh, in Luke chapter 15, Jesus gives us stories, parables about lost things. In Luke chapter 15, there's the lost sheep, there's the lost silver, and then there's the lost son, the prodigal son. I think we all know the story of the prodigal son. He took his inheritance early, took uh, everything that he had, left his dad's home where he had every need met and pretty much everything he wanted. Uh, he went out and wasted it all on riotous living, doing his own thing. Finally, he has no money. He's left in this strange, faraway land. And uh, when I say far away, it wasn't far in distance, just, just far in morality. We've talked about that before in some of our other messages and teachings. But, but notice what happens when he's down there, nothing to eat except what he's feeding the, the pigs, the husk, and the slop. In verse 16 it says, but in verse 17, now notice that first phrase. And when he came to himself. When he came, can I give my translation? When he came to his senses. Right. Wow. This is not right. I, I, he had a change of mind. Before he said, I'm going to go head fast into this ride that's living. And, and this is going to be awesome. But then he finds out that it's not awesome. And when he came to his senses, he said, you know what I need to do? I need to turn around and go back to dad. I need to turn. So there has to be this changing of mind. You have to have a new mindset. Time is getting away from me here, so let me, let me just say this. What we're saying when we say a change of mind, we're talking about that substantial and that steadfastness where once we make a decision, we stick to it. You see, not only do I realize I need to make a turn, but I've had a change of mind. Not only do I need to make it, I'm going to make it, and I'm going to stick with it. Yes. Amen. Yes. 
How many people go through those first processes, start making the turn, but it doesn't last? There's not really been that changing of the mind. And you see, there's so many things we need to have our mindset changed about. We need to come to our senses, spiritual senses. The devil has lied to us up one side and down the other. And we are following after his lies. And we have believed all of these things. And now, not only do we have to unbelieve them, but we have to turn around and believe something totally opposite it's not easy to believe something totally opposite that you've believed for a long time do you realize we need to have a change of mind even of our perception of God you know for most people God is a glorified Santa Claus the only time I need him and can call upon him is when I have a need. Lord, or, or, or yeah, Lord, I've been on the naughty list, but I'm trying to get on the good list because I need something from you. But apart from that, they have nothing to do with God. We need to change that perception that He is our loving Heavenly Father. He knows everything about us. He wants the best for us. And only He can provide the best for us. So you can go on in your life thinking into the lies of the devil that I can do it without God, but you're going to run uh, into the end, find out that it's too late. You didn't make the turn. Uh, but, but we all need the Lord. What about sin? We need a complete mind change of sin. We need to see the utter awfulness of sin. Most people look at sin, well, just a mistake. It's not that big of a deal. But sin is what sends you to hell. Right. Amen. Sin, the Bible does say there's pleasure in sin for a season. And people look at it, man, look at the fun, look at the fun, look at the fun, look at the enjoyment, look at the pleasure. Yeah, you'll get it for a season. But what you need to realize is that sin separates you from God. Sin destroys your life. Rebellion is going to set you on a course that the end is not going to be good. I don't care what happens in this life. You may be the most successful person in this life ever was, but in the life to come, you're going to see that you've been and or I've been an utter failure without God. So we need a change of mind about ourself. It's not all about me anymore, but it's about others. It's about God. Joy as uh, you know, the acronym people have given, J-O-Y. It's Jesus first, others second, and you last. So we need a change of mind about all of these things, of this, this stinking thinking. Amen. Amen. We need to turn. Yes, we do. But let's hurry, and i got to be quick here because we've already touched upon these. So uh, the Holy Spirit convicts us, convinces us, pricks us, letting us know, uh, screaming uh, uh, signs and blinking lights. You're on the wrong road. You need to make a turn. And then we begin to think about that. Yeah, maybe I do need a turn. And, and, and we begin to think differently and, and process and so forth and repent. But, but the second thing is this, is when we come to that point and we know we need to make a turn, uh, we're having a change in our senses, in our mind about all of these things as related to God. The third thing, which is definitely found in our text, is I call it the confession to the sovereign. Uh, confession to God. He, he's the sovereign God the Father. And did you notice in the text that the Lord said, Paul, I want you to open their eyes and I want you to turn them from to, from darkness to light, from the power of Satan to God. So there's got to be a confession of the sovereign. You could put it, there's got to be a coming to 
the Lord. You're convinced now. You're beginning to have a change of mind about all of these things. And then what is that going to lead you to? A true repentance of where now you're going to turn to God. You're actually going to make that turn. But how do you do that? Pastor, you said it's a free gift. How, how do I make that turn? It's by what I've, con what I've put here, confession. We've, got to, we've sinned against God the Father. As Jesus taught us to pray, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. We are indebted to the Father. And so we must confess to the Father. Yes, as Paul said in Romans 10, we must confess that Jesus Christ, that He is Lord, and that God has raised Him from the dead. But the very first thing we've got to confess is our sin. Lord, I have sinned against You. And I'm sorry. I've had a change of mind. It's not what I thought. And now instead of braggadocious in my rebellion and sin and how I'm getting along with all of this, now I see the corruption and the misery and the uh, faultiness of it. And Lord, now I come confessing my sin. Let me just give you a couple of, of verses. One that we use all the time when we're talking to people about how to be saved is 1 John chapter 1 and verse 9. Uh, many of us, we know what it says, but here John says, if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So the third step of turning is you've got to turn to God and you've got to confess sin. One of the saddest stories about the great man of God and man of war and so on and so forth, David. But when he committed adultery with Bathsheba and had Uriah, her husband, killed by putting him on the front line of the battle and ensuring that he would be killed so that he could marry her because she was with child. You may think David ran out and confessed that and instantaneously got back to God, but sadly he did not. As you make your way through the Bible and you try to, with the chronology of it and the sequence of things, this probably went on for a year that he did not repent. He did not confess. And then finally when he did, when the prophet came to him and said, you are the man, there's two Psalms, Psalm 32 and Psalm 51. The direct context is when David is trying to pray a hole through heaven. When he comes to that place, he knows that what he has done is completely wicked. And he needs to confess to God. Listen to what he says, Psalm 32 and verse 5. I acknowledge my sin to you. And my iniquity have I not hid. I said, I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord. And he forgiveth the iniquity of my sin. Somebody say, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. If you meet it in your heart and you turn to the Lord and you confess your sins. Yes. He's going to be faithful and just. And just as David said, even this great sin of murder and adultery, the Lord forgave him. If you go to Psalm 51, you'll see a similar uh, tenor that is within that about uh, forgiveness. But I'm, I'm, I'm simply going to go to verse 3. For I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Lord, I'm, I'm not going to tell my wife about them. I'm not going to, I mean, that's fine. But what I'm saying is, if you want forgiveness, you don't tell anybody else 
except God because he's the one you've sinned against. Now, yeah, you've sinned against man. You've sinned against your wife. You've sinned against others and you need to make that right. But initially, you've got to confess it to God. The last thing is this, and here's where people go awry. There's that conviction, pricking of the Holy Spirit, you need to turn. There's that coming or changing of our senses, changing our thought process about this. And then there's this confession to God the Sovereign King because we've sinned against Him. But then once we've made confession of our sins to God, ask Him to forgive us, then here's where the turn comes in. We turn not only to God, but in the same manner we turn from our sins. See, a lot of people, they just want to add Jesus to their long list of activities. <clears throat> oh, I need Jesus in my life. Okay, Lord, I accept you into my life. But they make no change. They just go on about how they lived before. Same old, same old. And they just added Jesus to their long list. No. No. Even the very name of Jesus. His name shall be called Jesus. Why will his name be called, Je be called Jesus? Because he will save his people, not in their sin, but from their sin. And that's where a lot of people miss it totally, that, that Jesus is saving me in my sin, no matter what I do. I don't, I don't know if you saw it, and I don't watch it, and I, the only reason it drew my attention, it was on the news, and it was some time back, the uh, Bachelorette or whatever, it was this gal that, you know, they have these guys that come, and they go through this series of stuff, and she decides who she's going to date or who she's going to marry. I, I don't know, it's a bunch of foolishness. But anyway, she claimed to be a Christian. But she was having sex with all these guys. And people began to confront her, say, you claim to be a Christian and you're living an immoral life? And she said, Jesus loves me. I can live any way I want to. Really? Really? I know His love is greater. He'll forgive us. He has long-suffering. He'll forgive us once. He'll forgive us twice. He'll forgive us three times, four times, five times. Uh, he'll forgive us over and over and over. But yet one thing He wants from us is that we are going to cease our sin. We're never going to be sinless perfection. We're never going to be able to live without sin. But yet what we know that we're doing wrong, we are to pray that the Lord's going to be our deliverer. We just sang about, Lord, Lord, my Savior, God, my healer, you're my deliverer. Yes, he is. Yes, he is. Lord, I need you to deliver me so that I can stop this sin. Yes. Amen. Turn. Oh, I wish I had another hour, but I don't. Proverbs chapter 28 and verse 13. Listen to what it says. You, you want, you want a, a tidbit of wisdom. You want a tip of wisdom. Listen, Proverbs 28 and verse 13. He that covers his sins shall not prosper. And I'll hang on to it. But he, let's see, awesome place, 13. But he who confesses, which we've already talked about to God, and then what's the next step? What's the next step? Forsaking, Forsaking them. You got to turn your back on them. You, know, you don't just turn to God, but if you turn truly to God, you're going to turn your back on sin. Right. Amen. He 
Amen. Yes. Turn. Turn. Yes. From the pulpit to the pew. Rich Gold Eisen. Turn. Let me give you one scripture and I'm going to close. It's found in the New Testament this time, 2 Timothy chapter 2. In verse 19, 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 19, honey, get ready, go ahead and come if you want. <clears throat> 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 19, nevertheless, the foundation of God stands sure, having this seal. The Lord knows them that are his, and let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. change your mind. You don't want to. Now, yeah, you may struggle with it, but I'm telling you, even after you do it, you're going to feel misery and pain. And as somebody said, why would you submit? But we do. Why would we submit to a moment of pleasure and live a lifetime of regret? A moment's pleasure for a lifetime of regret. It isn't worth it. Yeah, Jesus saves us. There's not a thing that we can offer as far as it's a free gift. But church, when it comes to accepting that gift, the key word is turn. Have we turned? Have you turned? Have I turned? Even after I, I made the initial turning to come to Christ and I am saved, what about those individual choices out there every day? Do I just continue to go headstrong into them or do I turn and say, Lord, help me. Help me. Deliver me. Deliver me. It's surely a subject that one that we all need to consider. And so if you'll stand with me right now, and if you just close your eyes. As I said, I can't make that choice to turn for you. You can't make it for me, but I, 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 I just, I want you to ask yourself, and you know whether you have or not. Have you made that turn? The Spirit of God, no doubt, if you haven't, is, is pricking your heart right now. Your heart begins to beat faster. You want the service to end. You want to get out of here. You're uncomfortable. There's got to be that change of mind, and i got to turn from the darkness to the light. I've got to turn from the power of the devil to the power of God. And so here this morning, I, I want to give that invitation that if you've not made that initial turn to, to become a child of God and confess your sins, and tell the Lord that you're sorry for them and not just sorry that you got caught, but you're sorry enough for them that you want to quit. You want to cease. You want to depart from. You want a complete change of life. But even as Christians, are we turning when we need to? Are we rejecting the the demonstration of the world and the desire of the world, the lust of the world? Or have we been succumbing and giving in to? And, and I know it's a struggle. I know there's so much out there. And I know that we've all faltered and failed. But come back to the Lord and say, Lord, I don't hide my sin. I confess it up front to you. I know that you're the one that I sinned against. So how many is going to meet me here at the altar? How many is going to take a moment and pray? And you see, I, I, I don't know how you need to pray. You don't know how I need to pray. All
all together, but let's just all come and let's do pray. Let's come and spend a little bit of time here and say, Lord, that I need to turn.